Well, welcome everyone to the Life Saving Divorce Book Study Chapter 10. I'm the author, Gretchen Baskerville, and I've been a Christian divorce recovery leader in churches since 1998. And today we are discussing moving on, finding happiness after a life saving divorce. Now, before we start, I want to do a little ad here. I want you to know that the Reclaim Conference 2021 is coming up on January 22nd through 24th. It's a virtual conference and it's for women only. Sorry, guys. Uh, women who want to restore the years, the locust eight after abuse. And then the other thing I want to let you know about is that I'm leading a divorce care group starting in January. Um, this first one is going to be for women only. It is on Zoom. Uh, my church wanted me to lead a group and it will meet on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. So we're going to dive in, but first let's pray. Dear Lord, as always, we are so grateful for your love, your care, your guidance in our lives. Thank you for watching over us and our children. Give us comfort when we feel fear. Give us wisdom when we don't know which way to turn. Give us strength when we feel weak. In Jesus' name, amen. Moving on and finding happiness on the other side. We're going to discuss facing reality and accepting the truth. Two, healing from trauma and PTSD. Uh, you'll notice that you don't find many experts calling abuse victims and infidelity survivors codependent anymore. We're seen as trauma survivors. Number three, dealing with anger and avoiding the bitterness trap. Number four, overcoming loneliness. Number five, forgiveness, what it is and what it's not. And then six, to remarry or stay single. And either one can be a good choice. As we discussed in chapter six, the Bible chapter, God doesn't hold you responsible for someone else's behavior. And historically, the way Christians have interpreted this is that the innocent spouse has been able to remarry. All right. We'll also talk about some myths of remarriage. Does everyone want to remarry? I mean, that's what our church has told us. We divorced women were seen as predators who wanted to take away their man. But is that really true? No, we'll find out the truth. Not even close. About half of Christian women and men do not want to remarry or reluctant to marry. Only two in 10 women and three in 10 men say they are absolutely sure they want to remarry. Okay, so before we start, let's take some polls. I want to know more about you. Is only for those who are not yet divorced or not divorced at all or just considering it. For those of you with marital problems who are not divorced, meaning your divorce is not final, you do not have a judgment, how is your overall life satisfaction right now? A, very unhappy. B, somewhat unhappy. C, somewhat happy. And D, very happy. So go ahead and place your votes. I'll give you another 15 seconds here or so. So it's really, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I, we took a, a, a poll at the end of uh, last week's session. So I have kind of a sense of, of what, what's going on in our group. Okay, so at this moment, we've got some people who are very unhappy, uh, a lot of people who are somewhat unhappy, a few that are somewhat happy, and then about an equal number who are very happy as very unhappy. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. I can, I can completely understand that. Okay, so we are pretty evenly divided, a little bit stronger on the unhappy side than on the happy side. Okay, for, I have some good news for you all. Um, here's the second one. Now read everything again. For me, the two things I want to overcome are, and you can pick up to two items, A, anger and or bitterness, B, feelings of rejection, C, loneliness, D, fears about making it financially, E, anxiety that I'll never be happy again, 
F, worry about my relationship with my child or children. G, fear I will never find love again. H, concern that I have disappointed God and am disqualified from serving him again. I, feelings that I'm a failure. J, something else. Or K, at this time, none of these issues bother me. So the, the concern about anger and bitterness is really common. A lot of people worry. They, they're very concerned. Will I be this angry and this bitter all of my life? I mean, is this, is this going to be what I'm, am I going to, you know, be an old crotchety, horrible, angry person for the rest of my life or, or what's going to happen to me? Almost every person of faith who experiences a life-saving divorce is worried about their future and feels at least some of these things at first, like I've got a black cloud over my head or I've got that red D for divorce on my forehead. Everyone can see me coming. I'll never be happy again. No one good will ever love me again because I've got too much baggage. And then they wonder if they've messed up their lives forever thinking, you know, I've missed God's plan A and plan B, and now I'm down to plan ZZ. I mean, I'm, I can't really expect anything good to happen to me. Or I'm disqualified now. God can't ever use me again. Or I've let God down. I've been a failure at the one basic task in life, getting married and having a family. And the truth is, these are lies that come from our own sense of fear and shame. And um, a lot of people say these are lies from the devil. The first 12 months, I will admit, of the divorce process are really tough and miserable. And I would, when I say divorce process, that might even include, um, it depends on how you want to count it. That might count separation as well. But they are tough and they're miserable. Um, but I do want to say that someday you will smile again. And if you needed a life-saving divorce, it's likely that you'll be back to your normal level of happiness before long. By the end of the first year, most people can, you know, have one of those deep belly laughs, laughing out loud and feel hope. By the end of the second year, most people feel as if they're going to survive. They're not quite sure how, but they feel that way. By the end of the third year, most people feel fairly optimistic about the future. And I love these Bible promises. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. And I love this one. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I will help you. What I love about this image is he's hanging on to you. You may not even have the strength to hang on to him. He's hanging on to you. All right, so let's take a look at our, our results on our, on, our, um, on our survey. So, okay, 18% anger or bitterness. That's something you really want to overcome. No one feelings of uh, rejection. Loneliness, 6%, yeah. 24% feel, fears about making it financially. Yeah, that was me too. Absolutely. I had to make decisions like gallon of gas or, uh, you know, a, a gallon of milk. I mean, what am I going to buy? I can't buy both. Anxiety that, you know, I'll never be happy again. Worry about my relationship with my children. Yes, absolutely. And then jumping down to something else. So if the person who voted something else wants to share with us, they can they can put that in the chat and we'll come back around to that. All right, so I get that. And, and children, it's interesting. Children are almost always the number one concern of people getting divorced. And so we're very typical in, in that sense. I wanna take you through kind of the stages of uh, divorce recovery. And the first is facing reality. So the first step is facing reality and accepting the truth. For some of us, we didn't see it coming. Maybe our spouse cheated on us in the past and we forgave and we thought everything was better and then it happened again. And then there was a straw that broke the camel's back. Some of us were completely in the dark until we knew something was wrong. You know, our spouse no longer wanted to be with us. We got left behind. And, um, you know, when that happens, you just can't avoid the truth any longer. 
Others of us knew there were problems in our marriage, maybe contempt, maybe neglect, maybe endless criticism, maybe addictions. Maybe they were living a whole secret life, a hidden double life. But we just kept hoping and praying that God would miraculously heal our marriage. And we wanted to see things change so badly. We took any small positive thing our spouse did and just cling to that as a sign of improvement. So accepting reality is a huge step. And it's often really crushing for people who prayed hard and tried hard. The second is that we really need to come face to face with the whole idea of what is it that's happened to us? And that's the healing from the trauma and the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder. You don't find, like I said earlier, many experts calling abuse victims and infidelity survivors codependent anymore. Codependent implies that a person is weak, that they just don't have any backbone. And now we see abuse victims as trauma survivors who gave it their all, who courageously use all, every bit of their strength to hold their marriage together, not pathetic individuals who couldn't stand up for themselves. It used to be said that codependent people came from these troubled or repressed or dysfunctional families. And while I'm sure that many of us come from families with dysfunction, a huge number of us are from solid, loving homes with parents who've been married for more than 40 years. I mean, my parents have uh, passed up the, the 60 year mark, um, wow, this year. So let's face it, chronic abusers and cheaters are really good at playing on our emotions and grooming us to take the abuse. They choose us because we're givers. We're loving, we're kind people. We have generous personalities. We have a strong, strong commitment to marriage. We have a deep sense of fair play and a good conscience. So they abuse us or betray us and then alternate with these tearful confessions that play on our generous personalities and our sense of fair play. And then they confess and they love bomb us and they're super attentive. And then when they guilt us into forgiving them over and over again, we go along with it because we have very tender consciences. So the unresolved conflict and betrayals stack up trauma upon trauma, and they just begin to crush us. And that's when we start to lose our self-respect, our voice, our vote, our ability to veto things. And many people experience the abuse cycle. Remember, we saw that in chapter four, which slowly wears down your boundaries and your self-respect so that you have fewer and fewer options. The term codependency implies that we're weak, but that's just not true. That's not us. Early in the marriage, we probably fought back. We said something. We may have walked out the door. We spoke up. But when that didn't work and the abuse or the sexual immorality or neglect continued, we just found other ways of responding, like talking to friends or trying to kind of distance ourselves from the chaos. And sometimes that worked for a while, but then what happens? You know what I'm going to say. Your spouse isolates you from your friends. They don't let you work outside the home. They don't want you to share with people at church. And after trying dozens of tactics, eventually you feel trapped, kind of like a prisoner of war. There's just no way out. So uh, as you saw in chapter 10, we talked a lot about prisoners of war and combat veterans there is only so much trauma one person can stand. And in um, you saw in Judith Herman's book, uh, Trauma and Recovery, the two um, psychiatrists from World War II who determined that in 200 to 240 days in combat, that's all it would take to break even the strongest soldier. So if 240 days in dangerous conditions is enough that even the strongest soldier gets PTSD. Imagine the family members in a 20 year marriage, which is 7,300 days of always walking on eggshells, always nervous that they might set off the abuser, 
always worried about danger, always being hyper vigilant. Where are they now? Are they cheating on me? Are they doing something they shouldn't be doing? Are they lying to me? The hyper vigilance takes a toll on your body because your stress has got to go somewhere. We may not be listening for bombs falling like a soldier does or enemy fire or tanks, but you look out the window, don't you, to ascertain the mood of your spouse before they walk in the door or listen for the garage door to open, constantly gauging what's going on. And so when I say you've got PTSD and when your doctor tells you you've got PTSD, believe them. You've You've earned it fair and square. Um, so what can you do if you've lived this life for a long time? And what do you do if you have PTSD symptoms? For example, and uh, this isn't a full list, but you can look it up online. Things like vivid flashbacks, nightmares, disturbed sleep, inability to concentrate, uh, intense distress, at symbols of trauma. These are the, those things that trigger you that don't trigger other people. Physical sensations such as pain or sweating or nausea or trembling or just being jumpy or easily startled. So one thing to do is to find, you know, a trauma-informed therapist who really understands the dynamic. Another thing you can do is read everything you can get your hands on, but that has to be from experts on the topic. You know, we we can all share our, you know, our, our opinions but you need to talk to people who've actually um, gone through it, what worked for them, what didn't work for them. And if, if finances are really, really tight, and I know they are tight for many people in this group, join a good divorce recovery group um, or join one of the free um, trauma recovery uh, private Facebook groups. So what Dr. Herman found and reported in her book, uh, Trauma and Recovery, was that the strongest protection against overwhelming terror was the relationship between the soldiers and their leader within their fighting unit. And the power of camaraderie and loyalty to your team makes a huge difference. The soldiers were able to talk for hours through their terror and rage and grief. And this made just a huge difference. Simply retelling their stories to one another and recounting the details of the trauma helped them find relief from their emotional injuries. This is why you have to tell your story. Now, a lot of people don't wanna hear your story. You don't wanna overwhelm your single friends because they have no idea what you're talking about. And you don't wanna just drop it all on your married friends because you know they've got enough things going on in their lives. And so you need to find some people who've walked in your shoes. Um, EMDR, you've probably heard about that, is one of many therapies for PTSD in combat veterans. And it's used for rape victims and emotional abuse victims and torture victims. It was started in the late 1980s and it's really caught on in the past 20 years. So if you have those symptoms of PTSD, I strongly recommend that you ask your therapist about EMDR. Now it doesn't solve all the problems. It's really focused on certain ones. So you need to ask. Uh, there's other methods, for example, something called PE, prolonged exposure, or similar treatments that are proven to help PTSD or complex PTSD. So I don't want you to think of yourself as weak, but to think of yourself as traumatized from staying in a combat zone for a long time. Now let's go into that area about dealing with anger and avoiding the bitterness trap. So is all anger bad as our religious upbringing taught us? Um, some churches and pastoral counselors act like anger is a terrible sin and we need to get rid of it right away. It needs to be swept under the carpet, confessed immediately. But I want you to notice we can be angry and sin not. We need for our own healing to tell our stories. And part of our stories is to express our anger at the injustice. But we can't tell our stories to just anyone only to safe people who will listen. So 
as you're going through this process, you might want to test people and ask people about their view of divorce for abuse. And that will tell you a lot about them, whether they are on your side or whether it's going to be a long uphill battle to convince them. Because what you're looking for is a band of brothers or a band of sisters who can share war stories with you and receive understanding and empathy. I love the Psalms in the Old Testament. Many of the Psalms are Psalms of lament, like Psalm 44, Psalms about how we have been crushed, how God has seemingly abandoned us, we've been destroyed. And some of the Psalms are what they call imprecatory Psalms, which means Psalms where we ask God to punish those who've hurt us. And I think there is a place, we see this in the Psalms of David, to ask for God to intervene for us, to punish those who've hurt us, to take vengeance, because vengeance is rightfully God's job, not ours. There is a time for anger, and there is a time for God's people to join together and cry out to the Lord for justice for what has happened to you. And in a community like a divorce recovery group, where you're sharing your stories, this is really important. And it brings a lot of healing. Now, people say, well, oh, you know, your divorce recovery groups, are you just bashing men? Um, when I, Because uh, I do lead some that are women only. You just sit around and you complain about your exes and you just bash men. No, 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 no. I don't let that happen in my groups. Um, but what I do want you to do is tell your story, where you're at this week, what's going on in your life. Share. This is a safe place to come and share. So let's go back to the soldiers with PTSD. After the war, many of them continued to get together into groups, those rap groups that I mentioned in Chapter 10. And these became an opportunity to advocate for each other and to end the stigma of PTSD. And I'd like to see that happen in our groups too. So these combat survivors, they wanted respect and they wanted to be treated with dignity, just like we who got life-saving divorces do. We don't wanna be seen as weak people or as quitters who took the easy way out. We want to be respected for our stories. Now, so what is bitterness? You, you read Sandra's story on page uh, 376. That's where, you know, we're wanting revenge. We're blaming that person for everything going bad in our life. And I understand that there's a certain amount we do rightfully blame them for. But when we start looking forward to seeing them fail, when we even want to assist in their downfall, when we want to just grind their noses into the dirt, that's when we're starting to step over the line. So Sandra, in her story, she realized three years after her husband left her that her husband was long gone and that the bitterness was just eating her up. So she chose to reject the bitterness, forgive him, forgive herself, uh, forgive God. So you need to turn your anger into advocacy, not injury. So when people say, oh, you're so angry and bitter, I say, no, I'm not. I'm the watchman on the wall. I'm sounding the alarm against physical, emotional, and spiritual abuse in our faith-based marriages. That is my job. Another criticism you may get is the do not slander rule or do not gossip rule. You know what I'm talking about. You can tell your story. In fact, for your healing, you must tell your story. Um, many people who've endured significant neglect, abuse, or betrayal are silenced because they're being accused of gossip or slander. And they and, and there is that Bible verse, right? 1 Corinthians 5.11 that says, you know, stay away from slanderers. But remember the meaning of slander. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And so these people with these tender consciences, they wonder, am I sinning against my ex-spouse by telling my story, which does make my ex-spouse look bad? The answer is no. Your story doesn't make them look bad. Their own sinful behavior is what makes them look bad. It's not a sin to tell your story. It's actually vital. 
It's not a sin to identify the abuse and call a spade a spade. It's not a sin to tell your story and ask for empathy, to want support, and to put the responsibility where it belongs. Now, if you're telling the truth, you are not slandering. Slander is a legal term. It's oral defamation in which someone tells an untruth, which they know is untrue about another with the intent to harm the reputation of the person defamed. So as long as you're telling the truth and your goal is to ask for care, you are not slandering. Now let's look at gossip. Gossip is really kind of interesting too. Gossip legally is an interesting concept. According to what I've read, employers cannot prohibit you from talking about your work conditions, even what your salary is, how much money you make, whether you're being treated well or not. So if your goal is just to tell the truth and, and discuss what happened to you and ask for justice, that is not gossip. And finally, let's look at the Bible. It's interesting to notice that we have no evidence that Jesus forgave those who plotted to kill him, attempted to trap and trick him, tell lies about him, and smeared his character during that entire three years of his life and ministry on earth. There are no stories of Jesus forgiving his attackers until the very end of his life. During his life and ministry, he called his enemies vipers, whitewashed tombs, hypocrites, sons of the devil. I think that's rather interesting, don't you? He, uh, he forgave them on the cross, but he held them responsible during his lifetime. So let's talk a little bit about overcoming loneliness. I tell my story on page 395, um, but you know, loneliness tends to hit us at certain times. Oftentimes it's those nights when you're alone, maybe the kids are with your ex, the kids are in bed, it's quiet, or it's the feeling when you're all alone and stuck at, at home and you have been cooped up for 284 days because of COVID-19, or it's going to church and realizing you've got no one to sit with for the first time in years. And maybe you come do what I did, which is to come into church a little bit late and slink into the back row so that no one sees you sitting alone. And those feelings of loneliness just come in like a giant wave on the shore and crash down on you. And you get knocked over and tumbled in the surf and you're struggling and grasping for air, trying to get through to the surface. And the loneliness whispers lies into your ear. And you start to think, no one will ever want me. There's no one who will stand by me. I'm, I'm unlovable. So most of the day, we can ignore these feelings because we're busy at work or running errands. But there are just times, maybe for you, it's the weekend. Maybe it's night, whenever it is loneliness sweeps in and just overwhelms you. And what helped me, um, and you can see my story on page 395, what helped me was clinging to the great Bible promises. I will never leave you or forsake you. Noticing how long each bout of loneliness lasted. Did it come at a certain time of the week, of the day? They may start out lasting all day and all night, but after some time, you find that maybe they only last a few hours. And then later, as you develop some good, safe friends, maybe they only last a few minutes. For me, I realized that though the loneliness tidal wave was painful, uh, it wouldn't in and of itself kill me. The giant wave would wash back out into the sea eventually. And I accepted this as just a normal part of the grieving process. The loneliness may never ever disappear for you, but the waves seem to get a little bit smaller and they roll back out a little faster. So let's move on to forgiveness, what it is and what it's not. Oh, you know, we as Christians are a little bit unique. Um, there are not very many other religions in this world 
that command forgiveness. And uh, I've had a Hindu friend say, you Christians are really unusual. We don't, we don't forgive until we see complete restitution and a complete and total life change. And I thought that's really interesting. He says, you believe in something called grace. And I thought, ah, that's what it is. So let's let's talk about this, because one of the things I want to make clear, and I hope I made it clear in chapter 10, is forgiveness is not on someone else's timetable. You do not have to forgive today or next week or next month. And when you're in the firefight, when your spouse is or your ex is traumatizing you, abusing you, lying false accusations, hammering on you, sending you nasty uh, name calling text messages, leaving you uh, voicemails. I'll tell you, it's virtually impossible to get safe enough to forgive. So I, I am not confident that people can forgive when they're in the middle of that firefight. Um, and I think that forgiveness for emotional abuse and trauma is completely different than say forgiving someone who rear ends you in an auto accident. When you think about it, an auto accident is relatively speaking, easy to forgive if there was no gross negligence, they weren't high or, or drunk or something. Sure, you're mad that your nice car got rear ended and that your car will, won't have the same value when you sell it. But let's say that it was truly an accident. That person just didn't see you. That's one thing. But the injuries from abuse are completely different because they are intentional. And often it starts with small intentional injuries. So the abuser building up demands and tension, that look at you, that stare, that note, that comment, that threat, that fear. There are lies. There are manipulations. There are little deceptions so you don't notice that they're cheating on you or watching you know child porn or something they are trying to play mind games so now you don't just have one thing to forgive you've got a dozen things to give they choose to put you down to call you names to uh, accuse you falsely to tell you you're incompetent that's deliberate so not only is it not just one incident the motivation is there too it's 10 things that go along with the abuse or with the betrayal. That means you need to remember each part of the injury in order to forgive it. So it's much more complex and you cannot let anyone tell you that you must forgive right now. No way. Anyone who demands instant forgiveness is minimizing what's been done to you and shortchanging the process. Forgiveness must be on your timetable, not theirs. And it is likely to take years. As I wrote this book, now understand my divorce was 25 years ago. I came across while doing the abuse chapter, something I had never thought of before that happened to me. And I looked at it and I felt it, the horror of it. And I called up my best friend and I said, you won't believe it, but I thought of something and I just felt something that I've never felt before. Would you pray with me? And she, of course she did. So I really want you to think in terms of forgiveness being a long-term process, whether, and a lot of people just say, you know, if forgiveness mean, means forgetting or saying it's okay, I'm not interested in forgiving at all. And frankly, I don't blame you. So forgiveness is not letting the offender off scot-free. Forgiveness is holding the offender responsible, including requiring reparations and accepting the legal consequences of their actions. Forgiveness wants repentance and compensation if possible, but not revenge. Remember, revenge is def defined as an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, okay? Forgiveness is not saying that the abuse, cheating, sexual immorality, and addictions are okay. Forgiveness is saying that the abuse, cheating, and betrayals are wrong and destructive, and there are consequences for the offender, such as the loss of trust and even the loss of the marriage. 
And then forgiveness is not acting as if it never happened. Forgiveness is saying it happened and it shouldn't happen again. Forgiveness is not refusing to look at the offense. It's not sweeping the injury under the carpet or refusing to see the damage done. This is why it's really hard to talk to someone who hasn't walked in these trenches. If you're not talking to another person who's been through a a life-saving divorce, they're not going to feel comfortable with you sharing all this stuff. Forgiveness is looking at the full damage and expressing the horror and the rage. It is to name the injuries and express the anger and sadness and grief aloud. It is speaking about the unspeakable. And then forgiveness is not saying forgive and forget. I hate this one. This one really drives me crazy. Forgiveness does not require forgetting. Forgiveness does not erase the offender's guilt or wipe out the consequences for the offender. And even if you've forgiven a person, you can still divorce them. Forgiveness does not give them a clean slate and a fresh start to hurt you all over again. I remember 25 years ago, I would say, you know what, I forgave him for that. So I can never bring that up again. I can't divorce him for that. I'm gonna have to wait for him to do something bigger or worse. Okay. And then forgiveness is not a one-time event, as I've already discussed. It's a long process. And as you tell your story and think about the past, you'll uncover some pain or hurt you hadn't seen before. You may have to forgive various parts of the abuse and betrayal. Forgiveness is also not becoming friends again. You don't have to trust them again or reconcile again. It does not require you to trust this person again or to befriend them or even to speak to them again. It does not mean that you have to answer their letters, emails, voicemails, or messages. You can go completely no contact. Forgiveness is permission to protect and distance yourself. As the the Apostle Paul says, you know, whatever it takes to live in peace. Well, whatever it takes to live in peace with an abuser is to get away from them. Forgiveness is not saying we'll go back to the same warm feelings we had before the betrayal. Forgiveness is facing the truth about the pain and injury. It may mean staying away from the dangerous person if possible. And if you're not raising minor children with them. In many cases, it might include cooperating with law enforcement just to keep this person from injuring others. So those are, those are the, big, the big things that I think we really need to understand about forgiveness. I wanna share with you one of my favorite quotes, it's in the book. Forgiveness isn't letting someone off the hook for the bad they've done. It's moving them from your hook onto God's hook. Don't you love that? That's from uh, radio counselor, June Hunt. So in some sense, in the spiritual realm, they are now God's problem, not ours. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and and God uniquely knows how to deal with your ex, and he knows how to right the wrongs. Okay, so we're going to do two polls. Okay, now this is only for those of you whose divorce is final. I don't know how many we've got in this group. If your divorce is already final, how would you rate your life satisfaction? A, very unhappy. B, somewhat unhappy. C, somewhat happy. Or D, very happy. And while you're voting, um, I will say that the vast majority of Christians, seven in 10, come out somewhere in that very happy or somewhat happy group within a couple of years of their divorce. And I and I didn't make up that statistic. That's from Baylor University Religion Data. Baylor University is the world's largest Baptist university. So I didn't get that from secular people. That's from Christians. Anyway, all right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what I'm seeing is very similar Uh, to what they saw in the Baylor study. The largest group was in the somewhat happy category, um, a large group in very happy. 
And I don't see any of you in very unhappy or somewhat in unhappy. Usually you, you, you've got somebody who's just in, in a world of hurt and you do have some people in the unhappy category. And I, I, what, I want to express my compassion and my empathy. If, if you are really hurting, um, I, don't, I don't give you these statistics to put you down this is not your fault. There could be all kinds of things going on in your life that would make any normal person really unhappy. So let's go on to the next poll. This is for everyone. How do you feel about remarriage? A, I do not want to remarry. B, I am reluctant to remarry. C, I'm unsure about remarrying. D, I want to remarry. And E, I have remarried already. As you all know, I was single for 20 years and I actually always wanted to remarry. I always thought, you know, I don't want to die without having one good marriage. <laughs> but it, uh, you know, it took me a long time to find the right guy. So let's take a look. We have 5% who are sure they do not want to remarry. We have about a third say, I am reluctant to marry. So between the, the two groups, that's 37%. That's, that's like four in 10. We've got 26% uh, saying, I am unsure about remarrying. And we have 35% uh, who want to remarry, definitely they know they want to remarry. And then I'm going to assume that the 5% of remarried did want to marry. So about 40% who definitely wanted to remarry and about 35% who definitely not or pretty reluctant. Okay. Well, let's take a look at how this compares um, with some of the myths we hear. So myth number one is, um, and by the way, to remarry or to stay single, as you saw in that chapter, either one can be a great choice after a life-saving divorce. And I'll explain in a minute uh, what I mean. Myth one says everyone wants to remarry. And this is the notion that some married women at church have, that the newly divorced woman is out to grab their husband. Um, and it's just not borne out by data. More than half of women normally, and not in our study, but in, in um, 2004 study, uh, more than half of women didn't want to remarry or felt reluctant to remarry. And so that means about 56% of women and 47% of men. Only 17% of women and 27% of men were absolutely sure in this nationwide study that they wanted to remarry. In our group, we're higher, right? We're higher than, than this uh, national average. Okay, myth number two. Your second marriage is likely to end in divorce and you won't be any happier because you bring your problems with you. Have you all heard that one? <laughs> I've heard that one a million times. And of course, this is partially true. Second marriages do have about a 60% divorce rate, but you saw that researchers Hawkins and Booth studied marriages that have been unhappy for 12 or more years. In other words, these are the people who needed the life-saving divorces. And here's what they found. Divorced individuals who remarry have greater overall happiness, okay? Those who divorce and remain unmarried have greater levels of life satisfaction, self-esteem, and overall health than unhappily married people. So what they're saying is that whether you remarry or not, you're likely to be happier having gotten out with a life-saving divorce. Now, let's look at myth number three. You'll never remarry and you'll live a miserable, lonely life. Okay. The truth of the matter, and, you know, I was, I was single 20 years. And there were times that I thought, oh, I'll just, you know, the way it's going, you know, I'm, I'm plump. I'm very opinionated. I'm almost 60. There's just no way I'm getting married. And I like things my way. 
you know, after you've been single that long, you really like things your way. In fact, I was warned, you know, don't get too independent, Gretchen, or you won't ever remarry. Well, I finally told the person who said that, you know what, it's too late. I am totally independent. And so what happened, look at the red square. The researchers could have predicted that I would be happy. Uh, of course, not the first two years. The first two years are just miserable, horrible things. But I did, I did move past those. And the researchers could have predicted that. They had already found the people were happier once they got out of a destructive long-term marriage. And based on their findings, it doesn't matter whether you remarry or not. You will be happier on average. That's so it's not a promise than if you had stayed. And then I like the little quote below that box. It says, remaining unhappily married rather than divorcing is never beneficial to the psychological well-being or overall health of the individuals in this study. Grateful that that was borne out to be true in my case. All right. I want to remind you before we go to the group discussion uh, that the greatest evangelist in the Gospels was the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, who had five husbands, probably some of whom divorced her and sent her away. Remember, we talked about that in the Bible chapter. Men could initiate and act divorces. Uh, and if they were followers of Hillel, Rabbi Hillel, they could dump you for anything. And now she was cohabiting. So if, if she was the greatest evangelist, in the Gospels, with that kind of track record, life is not over. Your ministry is not over, my friends. If you love the Lord, he will use you no matter what your marital status. And though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Amen. All right. So we're going to do a group discussion now. So here are the questions. Question one, what is your top fear about the future? What is one of your top losses that you mourn? Question two, name one way you cope with loneliness. Hmm. Question three, how do you view forgiveness? Question four, how do you view singleness versus remarriage? And question five, how does God's provision factor into your future.